but first of all, let's, if you have your bulletins and you have your insert, let's, let's do the, the catechism that we do every week. It will not be up here on the screen. Um, it is question number 36. And so if, uh, let me read the question and then we will read the answer together. The question is, what do we believe about the Holy Spirit? That he is God, co-eternal with the Father and the Son, and that God grants him irrevocably to all who believe. And the scripture for this is John 14, 16, and 17. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. And that is a great truth to learn today. I hope you uh, uh, enjoy going through those, because we are learning some, uh, what should seem kind of basic to us, but it's a good reminder for us, each and every one of these, as we go through them every week. Let's... Uh, Let's turn in, in our Bibles this morning to the book of uh, Leviticus. Oh, everybody says, what? Leviticus? Leviticus chapter 23. Now, I want to I preface things by just asking if everybody remembers what it was about last week that was uh, kind of special as far as the religious calendar. Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets. Um, we even had a, a ram's horn here. Um, that does not cease uh, as far as the, the different holidays, the different, I shouldn't say holidays, but the different uh, holy days, more specifically, that arise on the calendar as you see in the Bible. In fact, last Friday and Saturday into Sunday, was Rosh Hashanah. It's, it's called the head of the year, the, the, the Jewish New Year, uh, as far as on their civil calendar. And that's also corresponding with the Feast of Trumpets that we see in Leviticus chapter 23. Uh, but following up on that, 10 days later is the Yom Kippur, which is what I want to talk about today. Now, those in my Sunday school class uh, already had the misfortune of being bored by this several weeks ago, and so they're going to sit through it again. But I, hopefully there's, there are things that you can pick up on this that you may not have heard before. This is Yom Kippur. That actually begins tonight. Uh, Jews across the world will be celebrating this day, um, starting at sunset tonight, wherever you're at across the world. Um, the tragic part of that around the world is that they will be celebrating this without Christ in mind. And that's what I hope to be able to point to when we're, we're looking at the, the history of this event and what we see in the New Testament in regard to the atonement. Not just uh, the day of atonement, but the atonement itself. The atonement that Christ gives for our sins. So if you're in the book of Leviticus in chapter 23, we will begin with verse 32. Now, most of the scriptures that I will be quoting here tonight, uh, today, uh, I'll have most of them up here on the screen because we'll be all over. And so you'll be able to follow along up there for the most part. Uh, but this will be our, the center for our text, Leviticus 23 and chapter 16. The most solemn of days is what we see as far as Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Verse 32 says, It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and ye shall afflict your souls. In the ninth day of the month, that even from even unto even, shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. This is the most solemn of days. This is, this is the Day of Atonement, and more specifically, the Day of Atonements. When we look at all of these fall feasts, the Feast of Trumpet, the 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 Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles, which will be later on this week on the calendar, we see 
very similar themes, or related themes. For the Feast of Trumpets, the, the overarching theme is one of repentance. And that repentance leads us into the Day of Atonement, the one of retribution and redemption, both sides of that. Repentance, redemption, and then the Feast of Tabernacles. Because of that redemption, there is rejoicing. So these three feasts take those, those three major themes with them. When we look at Leviticus on the whole, we, we see an overall theme of, of holiness. Uh, Leviticus, I admit, and you know it as well if you've read through the Bible, and if you do that frequently, uh, Leviticus is difficult to read. Would you agree? Who enjoys the book of Leviticus? Everybody, raise your... No, just kidding. Uh, it, it's okay, I get it. Some of these books are, are hard to read, and Leviticus ranks right up there in, in books that are difficult to read. But read it next time with the theme in mind of Leviticus. It's about holiness. This is about God providing a way for man through, through his tabernacle and sacrificial system to approach a holy God. Be ye holy, for I am holy. And Leviticus is about that, that bridge in order to approach God. And ultimately, we see that fulfilled in Christ. We see that fulfilled in Christ. So the theme of Leviticus being holiness, there are those two verses. Peter quotes this verse from Leviticus 19. Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. In verse 26 of chapter 20, thus you are to be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy. And I have set you apart from the peoples to be mine. And this brings us again back to Leviticus 23 and the Day of Atonement, or the Day of Atonements. Now, the, the actual term for this is ha, Yom HaKippurim, which is the Day of Atonements, because we're not talking about an atonement when we talk about this feast. We're talking about many atonements. If we look back in Leviticus 16, which is completely dedicated to this feast, it's about, uh, well, read verse 33. He shall make an atonement for what? The holy sanctuary. He shall make an atonement for the tabernacle. He shall make an atonement for the altar. He shall make an atonement for the priests and for all the people of the congregation. There are several atonements happening over the course of this day. And this atonement that we see here is not a, a, a cleansing by water. We see that purification taking place in, in other situations. This atonement is a covering. That is the meaning of this word, kafar. It's, it's a covering. It's a, it's a layer to, to hide what is there. To, and we'll talk about this a little bit more uh, a little bit later. But this is not a, a water cleansing. This is a covering of blood. The atonement is about the blood. The blood covering for the holy sanctuary, for the tabernacle for the priests and for the people. This covering of blood was the only thing that was sufficient for the atonement. Now we see several uh, ways that uh, the Day of Atonements is, is referred to, uh, some in Hebrew idioms and the actual word Yom HaKippurim, which is the Day of Atonements. We also see it referred to as the Day of Covering, the Day of the Fast, the great fast, the day, the fast. Um, these are simply ways that are referred to uh, throughout history and in Scripture. Well, actually, that, that last one, the fast, we see in the New Testament. When we get to Acts chapter 27, you remember what's happening in Acts 27 and 28? We see Paul's trip to Rome, and Paul is getting ready to board a ship, and, and they're waiting for the, the ship to leave, and... We get to 27 and verse 9, it says, Now when much time was spent, when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already past, Paul admonished them. That fast is talking about the Day of Atonement. We know that this takes place in the fall based on this and the storm that happens. If you remember in Acts 27, there's a big storm. It's basically a Mediterranean hurricane called the Eurocladon. Uh, it's in the chapter there, and it's Google it sometime. It's, a, it's an interesting thing. It's a, it's a fall hurricane in the Mediterranean. 
a big wind that pushes in from the northeast. And this is what that's talking about. It takes place in the fall, and that's where we are at right now. The, the fast, the day of atonement. So when does this occur? Leviticus 23 says it's on the 10th day of the seventh month. Seventh month, There shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation. Remember, convocation is the, the Hebrew word mikra, which basically means a rehearsal. It's preparing for something else. All of these every year, all these seven feasts are a preparation for future events. They're a rehearsal. We think of it as a dress rehearsal. All of this pointing forward to the advent of Christ. There are four elements in the, uh, the feast of Yom Kippur, the holy convocation that we just mentioned, the humbling and the affliction of souls, the presentation of the offering, and the Sabbath of Sabbaths. You know, when we look back in, in biblical history and we look at Yom Kippur, we look at the Day of Atonement, prior to Leviticus 23 and 16, we see the events in Exodus. If you remember what happens in Exodus 32, it says, It came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement. What happened there in, in chapter 32 of Exodus? Moses had just come down from the mountain with the tablets the, of the Ten Commandments, the, the, the law, and what had the people done? They built a golden calf. And they were worshiping, they thought, Jehovah, but what they were worshiping was a golden calf. And here Moses says, now I must go and make an atonement. And for the next, Moses was up there for 40 days, he comes down and finds this, and he goes back up for how long? Another 40 days. So he goes up for another 40 days, and it's these days that are leading up to the day of atonement. Moses comes back down with that uh, atonement. And it comes to pass in chapter 34. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony to, in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone. Remember that in that story. His face shone so brightly that the people were afraid to even look at him. And here is another idiom for the Day of Atonement. The idea of face to face. Being face to face with God. Why is that? Because the priest, this was the one time a year that the priest went into the Holy of Holies. And approached the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat. And he was essentially face to face with God. One day a year. The first Feast of Tabernacles that we see following that uh, is in Exodus 35 and we see also in Leviticus 23. So these things follow upon each other, one right after the other. And we see it first occurring here in the book of Exodus. The atonement, let's talk about that, the atonement, the covering. Actually, I want to go back. I want you to see that list. The covering, the blood, the white garments, the scapegoat, and the prom proclamation of liberty. So again, that Hebrew word for atonement, kafar, means to cover. This is a covering, a covering of sin. It, it's, it's almost like a promise of future payment, a promise of future redemption. This, this covering, uh, it Liken it to a credit card where you have uh, this promise of future payment. It's covered for now, but then there will be a final, full, and complete redemption and payment of that which is owed. Which is what we see in Scripture, the, the payment of Christ on the cross. This is interesting because we have in atonement, we have the covering of sin. But then when we get to Christ, we have the final and complete taking away of sin. Remember what John the Baptist said when he saw Christ. Behold, the Lamb of God, which does what? Takes away the sins of the world. That final, that taking away of the sins of the world. Psalm 103.12 says that as far as the east is from the west, what? So far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Christ takes away that sin. There's the covering for the sin and then the final disposition and the, 
the taking away of sin. Micah 7.19 says, He will turn again, he will have compassion upon us, he will subdue our iniquities, and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Not just removed, but forgotten. Amen? <laughs> Are there some sins that, you know, I'm not asking for a raise of hands or anybody to stand up and... and are there some things that you're, you're, you should praise God about that they will just be forgotten by God? I think all of us are somewhat in that boat. On this holiest day of the year, this is the holiest day of the year on the calendar, even more so than Passover. And we'll maybe explain that here in a little bit. You have the holiest man. The, the high priest, Aaron in particular in, in Leviticus, going into the holiest place to proclaim the holiest name and the sprinkling of blood to make that atonement. He dips his finger in the blood and sprinkles it on all of these things for that covering and for that atonement. The importance of blood in this we see in in the New Testament, we see it as a token of the new covenant. And we, we celebrate that with the Lord's Supper. It gives eternal life. It brings redemption. It, it makes that atonement, that covering. It justifies before God. It, and it gives us forgiveness. It provides reconciliation. It provides cleansing. It, it enables us to be overcomers. We were, we were purchased with that blood. That is the importance of blood for our redemption. Galatians 3.13, Christ hath redeemed us. It is, it is the importance of that blood in, in our salvation, in our redemption. Hebrews 10 talks about the, the blood of the bulls and the goats. It says, for it is not possible that the blood of the bulls and the goats should take away sin. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast no pleasure. The, the blood of these animals for all of these years was not enough to take away sin. It was to cover it for now. And then it was Christ who would come and deliver us and deliver us from sin and take away that sin. So what's the difference here between Passover and atonement? They seem the, they seem the same. So... I want to talk about something here real quick. The, the Passover was for the forgiveness of the individual, the individual sins. Yom Kippur is for national Israel, a covering for the entirety of the nation, a, a, a do-over time. If, if there is no Day of Atonement, there is no national covering for the sins of all the people. Uh, the high priest on this day, and on this day only, um, he would take off these royal garments. You recognize some of this from Sunday school from a long time ago <laughs> and all the, the priestly garments. You, know, you have the breastplate with all the stones. You have the, the stones on the shoulders. You have the, the great linen ephod um, and the, the pomegranates and bells around that, that blue uh, garment there that you see. That is how we picture it. In fact, Many of us have been given this, this picture of the high priest going into the Holy of Holies and he has bells around his, his tunic. And you remember that other part of the story where they say they tied a rope around his ankle uh, just in case uh, he dies because he's sinful and they need to pull him out. Didn't happen, folks. Didn't work that way. Because on the very one day that the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies, to offer the sacrifice and the atonement on the mercy seat and in the, in the tabernacle, the high priest for one day a year is dressed like that. No bells, no pomegranates, no breastplate. The mitre itself is even different, the hat. It's all linen. And that's important when we look at the picture going forward of Christ and his return in Revelation. So in any case, uh, if you hear that, just didn't happen that way. Um, Israel had one shot at atonement, and that high priest had to be ready. 
and that high priest had to be prepared, and that high priest had to be sanctified. Um, they had one shot at that once a year for the high priest to go into the Holy of Holies, and no bells. Sorry. It's a neat little picture, right? But it just didn't happen that way. Um, in any case, Aaron comes into the holy place, Leviticus 16. says, with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering, he put on the holy linen coat. He shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, be girded with a linen girdle and the linen miter. Um, he will wash his flesh in water and so put them on, take off the congregation Take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goat for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. And we'll come back to those two kids, the two kids of the goats for a sin offering. Because this is what we are covering, covering of sin. Um, talk about the, the shedding of blood as being for the remission of sin. Isaiah 53, a very familiar chapter to all of us. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. There's an important term, afflicted, when we start talking about the Day of Atonement. Because it is for those 40 days. Remember, Moses came down, destroyed the golden calf, went back up and said, I'll come back with an atonement. And for 40 days, the second 40 days, the people are... There's devastation. There were, there were all the people that were killed that Joshua and the leaders killed that uh, sinned. But then there's this anguish for 40 days, this anxiety and anguish and affliction for 40 days, wondering if God will atone for their sin of the golden calf. And that is what we see throughout history. And we see in the New Testament as well that these 40 days leading up to the Day of Atonement are a time of affliction, self-reflection, repentance. But here we see also in this passage the, the two goats, the, the two goats for a sin offering. And that's where we come to the scapegoat. The two goats. Now isn't that pitiful? That's pretty pitiful. The two goats, the scapegoat. A scapegoat is simply meaning a goat that goes away. Uh, Azal, or uh, I'm trying to remember how that separates out. Oz is the goat and Azel is to go away. Uh, the, the goat that goes away. There would be lots cast on these two goats for a sin offering. And one would be a lot for the Lord and the other would be the, the scapegoat. The one upon whom the sin was sent away. A picture of what? The Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. This is that picture of the sins being taken away forever. So Aaron would bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell, usually in, from the right hand, and he would offer that for a sin offering, the sacrifice for sin. And then the other would be sent into the wilderness um, to make an atonement with him. Uh, to let him go as a scapegoat, the sins would be carried away forever and to be forgotten. Interesting, over the course of time, the goats would sometimes return back into the city. <laughs> they didn't want that to happen anymore because what's the picture? Your sin is coming back. So they would actually take the goat and actually shove it over a cliff <laughs> so that it wouldn't come back. But the picture is still there. The, the sins will not return. We see, actually, when we get to the time of Christ and beyond. Now, do you remember what year the, the temple is destroyed by the Romans? 70 AD. Right. I know somebody was thinking it. I heard you thinking it. Destroyed in 70 AD. The, we look at Jewish history and, and the Talmud. And the Talmud and Josephus actually record many ominous events that happened during four, the 40 years leading up to the destruction of Jerus or Jerusalem and the temple. Now what happens 40 years prior to AD 70? Crucifixion of Christ. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ happens around 30 AD. Well, there's several ominous things that happened during that time frame leading up to the final destruction of the temple. The lot for the Lord's goat wouldn't come up in the right hand, it would come up in the left hand. Um, the scarlet thread 
on the Day of Atonement, they would tie a scarlet thread around the, the door handles of the, the temple. And when the atonement was made, this is what the Jews say, that the, the scarlet thread would turn white. Now there's a picture for you. And this isn't coming from Christian writers. This is coming from non-believing Jewish writers of the time. Uh, the westernmost light on the temple menorah wouldn't stay lit, and the temple doors would open by themselves. Now, can you imagine these temple doors? They're probably about the size of the ceiling here in height and heavy. It would take more than just a breeze to open them, but they couldn't keep them shut during those 40 years. They would constantly open. Another picture, much like the rent veil, the opening of the temple, um, and all of these ominous things. Uh, there's actually another one that um, the Jews believed was a fulfillment of Zechariah 11, that destruction was coming upon the temple. And in fact, it was. Another picture that we have here from uh, this passage is the proclamation of liberty. Now, we were familiar with the passage from Leviticus 25 because it's actually inscribed on the liberty bell. It's the proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. That's a proclamation of the year of Jubilee. And Jubilee actually in its proclamation every 50th year happened on the day of atonement. Um, this is also brought to us when we look forward in Isaiah. Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. This is the exact passage that Christ quotes when he comes into the synagogue in Nazareth in Luke chapter 4. And there's that, that picture of Christ speaking in the synagogue. He opens to the book of Isaiah, he opens to what we call chapter 61, and reads that very same passage. Now, if we look at Luke 4, let's go back. Luke 4, if you look at this passage and you see what happens in Luke 3, coming into Luke 4, um, verses 1 and 2, Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. Remember the temptation of Christ. How long does it last? 40 days. 40 days in the wilderness, being tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. This is that same picture of those 40 days of affliction prior to the atonement. And he returns from there. And he, he comes into the synagogue in Nazareth in verse 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And he went back to the, to, to the synagogue on that Sabbath day. He stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of Isaiah. And then he reads that same passage we just read from Isaiah 61. And he got to the part where he says, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. He gave it to another minister in the synagogue, sat down, and they all looked at him. And he says, what? This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now just imagine. <laughs> this is a messianic passage. And he is proclaiming the fulfillment of this passage in him. Uh, their reaction was very um, predictable. All they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. They rose up to thrust him out of the city, led him unto the brow of the hill whereupon the city was built, that they might cast him headlong. Like what? Like the scapegoat. Like the scapegoat. They were going to cast him over, but he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. We go on, we can see the fulfillment of this. I, I love that picture in Luke 4, uh, when, we, when we view it in terms of the, of the Day of Atonement, because that is when that actually occurs uh, in Luke 4, is on the Day of Atonement. So we see this fulfillment in, in Leviticus um, 16, we read about the burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord. Um, boy, I'm going to be doing a Steve here, looking at the clock up until the end. Um, 
Luke 16, verses 12 through 15, talk about a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar. This is what's happening during the Day of Atonement. Um, incense, the sweet incense beaten small. Uh, he brings it within the veil, it says. That's within the Holy of Holies. Uh, he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony. Remember all that's happening when he goes into the holy place and then the Holy of Holies. The burning incense on the altar of incense lifts up and fills the entire room. That's the prayer. We learn from Revelation also. This is the prayer of the saints, of filling the nostrils, it says, of God, of Jehovah. So to the, and then he sprinkles the mercy seat. He sprinkles the blood of the sacrifices on the, uh, the tabernacle and on the furnishings, on the mercy seat of the Holy of Holies. He kills the go to the sin offering that is for the people. He brings that blood within the veil, it says. And the blood of the bullock sprinkles it all on the mercy seat. And here we see that, that prayer, that prayer before the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, the prayers of the saints, the incense rising up to God. Psalm 141.2 let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense. We see the same picture, folks. Get all the way to the book of Revelation. This is where it's just really fascinating. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood? And them that dwell on the earth. We go forward into chapter 8 and it starts talking about that same censer and the incense and the, the prayers of all the saints in Revelation 8, 3 through 6. We we'll get to, uh, let's see, where am I? Oh, there's the rest of that chapter. The garment stained with blood. Um, Isaiah 63. What do you think happens when you're wearing a nothing but a white garment? And you're spraying blood with your fingers. You get covered in blood. It's the same picture that we have in Isaiah 63 as well as in Revelation, uh, Revelation 19. Of this one, Isaiah 63, who cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Bozrah. And it talks about this person dressed in white and treading the wine in the wine press being covered in, in that wine and garments that were white are now stained red. It's the picture of the high priest who is making atonement for the people and for the nation of Israel. It's a day of vengeance, but it's also a day of redemption. And that is our redemption. Revelation 19, 2. True and righteous are his judgments. He hath avenged the blood of his servants. Uh, he was clothed clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. Atonement. That atonement that Christ gives to us through the shedding of his blood and the covering of his blood. I'm almost there, folks. Trust me. We'll get to the end. Um, maybe. <laughs> we also see this as the last harvest, the end of the world. That's where it, it wraps up into this final judgment uh, redemption and retribution. And actually, I'm just going to kind of sum, summarize some of this here at the end. This, the end of the year, this, this final judgment, the, the, the reaping, the harvest. We see this in Matthew 13. We see this in Matthew 24 and 25 in the Olivet Discourse. The field of the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The tares are the children of the wicked. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. This is talking about that same thing, the day of atonement. The reapers are the angel. And we're talking about the fall harvest, that of the wine and the grapes and the treading on the wine press the, and the, the reddening of the, the white garment. The last harvest here again in the end of the world, Revelation 18, the angel came out from the altar which had power over fire and cried with a loud cry to them. I had the sharp sickle saying, thrust in thy sharp sickle, gather the clusters of the vine. Back to Leviticus 16, 16 and 17, the, the empty tabernacle, the temple. This is another a picture of the day of atonement. He shall make an atonement for the holy place. 
go down there a little bit farther, there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation. When he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place, he hath made an atonement for himself. This is I, priest, and his household, and for all the congregation. Prophetic impl- implications for Israel. Folks, um, let me fast forward here. Boy, I'd, how does Steve do this? I don't, I don't understand. Get, getting all the way through to the end. I've got a minute and a half. Are you all going to walk out? Otherwise, I'll keep your... Uh, actually, I'm keeping Mike and Brett for another two hours anyway. <laughs> Many prophetic impl- implications for Israel because we are looking at the national atonement, the atonement of the nation of Israel. And what we see prophetically on this day through Paul's writings and in the Revelation is the future atonement of Israel. Even Paul says, all Israel, he, he desires that all Israel be saved, that they might be saved, Romans 10.1. We see here in Romans 11 that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. That's the time period we are in. The rest of that passage, so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer. It shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. This is something that will happen in the future. God's promise to finally deliver and atone for all Israel. All Israel at that time. And this is still in the future. This will happen uh, presumably on the Day of Atonement. In, as we see it uh, fulfilled in Revelation. God is not done with Israel, just like God is not done with us. God's atonement, God's covering, has great implications for us. Christ was our atonement, our covering for sin. And ultimately and finally, our sin will be taken away and cast into the depths of the sea. And that is the picture. After all of that... <laughs> After all of my bloviating, I I want you to remember the picture of God taking our sin, covering it with his blood, with the future promise of the final casting away of that sin forever and ever into the depths of the sea. As far as the east is from the west, God will take away our sins. Amen? Let's close in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you've done for us, Lord. Just, Lord, pray that you will give understanding where we, where we need it here, Lord, and that we uh, take and apply what you would have us to from uh, what we can learn about the atonement and the day of atonement, Lord, and what you have done for us on the cross. Lord, we, we lift up the rest of this day and this week and take us home safely. Bring us back safely this evening for our, our, our meeting with the Lauren Richmond, Lord, and we just uh, look forward to that. Lord, just guide and direct us now throughout the rest of this day. In Christ's name, amen.